The same with the Egyptian gods, a portal to where they come from is a part of that great pyramid system. It's a transport system. I transported through there back in time and went to three different places. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that we think in our evolved quantum physics understanding that we have to get in a ship and go through space. And yet there are all of these portal systems or wormholes that you can travel through that really do exist. Sonia Grace, welcome on the podcast. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Everything. <laughs> I'm excited about everything. Um, I, I, you know, every day I work on people. Morning to night, I am an energy surgeon. I am working on hearts, livers, spleens, cancers, blood, bones, you name it. I've worked on it. And every day I experience miracles happening. And it's just, it, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, people have phenomenal shifts in their health. I, I had a client the other day who, who calls me from Switzerland. And one of the people on her team was having really bad pain and problems. They put her on steroids and antibiotics. And I went in and looked at it and worked on her. And I said, no, this is kidney stones. This is, you know, crystals in the ureter and the bladder. And I went and cleared all that stuff out. And she wrote me later the day a text message and said, oh my God, she's so much better. It's incredible. That's my day. So every day I wake up, I'm like excited because I know that I am doing the work I'm here to do. I'm, I'm, I'm on purpose, on task. On purpose. I love that. And, you know, people just immediately got a grasp of just some of the plethora of abilities and, and mystical powers that you have and sort of trying to describe you would, would probably take me the whole podcast and, and sort of like describing a mythical creature that no one has ever seen. Um, I'd love to start off. It's, it's really interesting. You're the first time traveler that we've had on the show. And, you know, you were born with sort of this ability that your world has been deeply interwoven with the spirit realm and you've been able to see all the layers of consciousness, all the layers of dimension. And I'd love to first start off with this prophecy that you were given and you were told about, about the worlds that we are moving through in humanity that usually take up cycles of around 30,000 years. And we're sort of entering the end of the fourth world. If you'd love to sort of tell us exactly on a macro level what is going on in the world right now and mm -hmm. sort of explain really what humanity is moving through in consciousness. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Good topic. Okay. So, so when the Mayan calendar came to an end, that's when we were leaving and left the fourth dimension. We've moved into the fifth dimension. So this is super important for people to understand that since 2012, we've all been assimilating and trying to keep up with a super high vibration and level of intensity that the fifth dimension brings. And you remember in Star Trek, when they enter the nebula zone, you see the ship entering this, this area, we're just in the beginning of the nebula zone. And as we move further into it, it gets weirder and weirder because we have only known the fourth dimension as an entire human species on the planet. Now to correlate this with, you know, Hopi understanding the first world, second world, third world, fourth world. Yes. In, in, in reality, we are coming to the end of a phase of humanity. And as you are saying, we go through these phases every 30, 50,000 years. We go through a phase. This phase 
is coming to a close. And if you all have noticed, everybody's rushing to get their spiritual groove on. Everybody's trying to, you know, get like, okay, I, I didn't do my homework in, in the last 10 lifetimes. I better catch up, you know, and people are rushing because we aren't coming back to earth. This is it. Our children, our grandchildren, all the newborn babies right now, they're going to herald the next phase of humanity. They're like we were when we came through to Atlantis and Lumeria at the end of those civilizations. So all the newborns right now are star seeds, and they're coming in and we're passing the baton to them. We will, in fact, of course, when we die, we'll go to heaven and have time with God and hang out with all of our ancestors. But we will then go back to our home planets, which um, we all do come from different parts of the galaxy and beyond. Mm. Have you had the opportunity, you probably have, to visit your home planet in this lifetime, spiritually? Many or times. Many times. Mm. I've traveled off planet many times. And when my guides and let me preface this for your viewers um i am not a remote viewer mm -hmm. i am not a um a someone who who is able to just you know imagine myself there i literally go through a process and i have to go into meditation i have to wait in that meditation for my entire body to dissolve into small particles of sand and merge with everything in the room. And then my guides who are high angelic beings come and hold their hand out. I take their hand and we go. Mm. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not doing astral projection. And oftentimes people will hear about something and they'll project what they know onto that situation. This is this is totally different. So drop the astral projection idea because that's not what's happening. I'm literally going there. I feel it. It's cold. I, I wear a coat. I mean, it's bizarre. Yeah. I feel water on my face. I feel hot if we're in Egypt. I mean, it's it's it is a whole body experience. Yes. And, and you must feel very validated right now with all the information that's coming out with quantum physics, because as you are saying that your body is actually physically dissolving. And, you know, I've, I've read a couple of books about the masters of the Far East and how their powers, their CDs, they would call them. They're able to, as you said, dissolve the body and appear at another location in the world. How is this possible with what we know now about consciousness, about quantum physics, about matter, about energy? How is this all possible? Ah, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. I, so I don't experience time and space the way most people do. And I attribute that not only to the fact that I was born this way, I was born with all my gifts. Every lifetime I've had, I have incarnated as a healer or a mystic or someone who is working and helping other people. Okay, so that's a given. That's my karma, actually. Not an easy path to take. Mm -hmm. It's not all glorious and beautiful. You know, I deal with all kinds of stuff coming at me a lot. And all I can say is I, I, I'm... I'm honored to share this with you and with your viewers, but I wouldn't wish this on anyone because it's a very heavy burden to carry. Yes. So, so with that being said, you know, I find that people are um, experiencing so much right now. Our world, our society is squeezed with a, 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 a polarity of, this side or that side, this or that. And I've been saying since the end of the Mayan calendar, duality is splitting apart. As we understand duality, which is that outward measuring system that we all use. Oh, it's white. No, it's black. It's hot. No, it's cold. It's right. No, it's wrong. It's the light. Oh, it's dark. I mean, it's all of this way of measuring that we use. That is splitting apart. Mm. And as it splits apart, humans are being called 
to learn to reuse that inner system that we have that innately tells us something is right or wrong, good or bad. So, so as we evolve, we're in the fifth dimension, higher frequency, much like aliens who are here millions and millions of years, we're going to learn to adapt this new system that already exists inside of us huh. and, and step out of duality. And that is the beauty of meditation. That is the beauty of learning to sit in a state of neutrality and to sit in a state of inner peace because you're no longer engaged in that outward system. Hmm. Okay, we got that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fascinating because you know you mentioned that these were abilities that we have inherently within us, but well, also the, the duality aspect of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm, I want to be really clear on that because everybody's karmic path, which is why we're here, is different. Yes. What I do is not what my neighbor knows how to do. My neighbor is really good at, you know, selling properties. You know, my other neighbor is really good at cooking. That's the path. We get mixed up because we're all spiritual and we all are connected to God, to creator, to the earth. We all have that empathic feeling, but not everyone has the path karmically of what I'm describing with myself. Duality is something we all experience and we all have the ability to sit in meditation and and quiet the mind and go to a state of neutrality. Hmm. Yes. And and also you you've trained people in this in this what you, what you do through through meditation. So the people that are that are called in resonance to you, is it because they themselves also know that that's their path or the people that are drawn to you? How, how does that work? How do you see it? So, so I, I train people in healing, healing work. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't teach anyone how to time travel. That's just something that was given to me. That's something I'm able to do. I I'm not able to teach that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been meditating and working as a healer for 42 years. I mean, you know, I keep evolving like everybody else. So what happens for me is a result of my hard work and dedication to living my life in service. I mean, I gave my life up a long time ago and said, okay, creator, where do you want me? You know, do I get shoes or do I get a plane ticket? But where do you want me? Mm. And I have lived my life that way for a long, long time. And I don't teach what I do. I teach meditation. I teach how I do healing work. I only work with people who have those innate gifts that I'm able to see and identify. I've turned a lot of people away in my training course. Yeah, I'm very, very discerning as to who I will bring in to, to train. Hmm. Yeah, that that is that discernment is super key, and staying on the topic of 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 history of time traveling, I wanted to sort of mention to you that we've been fed, and and you know this, we've been fed a different history than we actually what actually happened in the past, and you've had this capability of of going back and seeing firsthand, ob observing what exactly happened in those time periods where your guides have taken you. And we've thought that humanity was a byproduct of this process of evolution, that we came from chimpanzees and came all the way into what we are now. But you've had a different perspective because you've gone back and you've actually seen what has happened. Do you want to enlighten us a little bit into our, hist our true history as human beings? Well, I, I was shown that uh, 20 million years ago, um, the form, the physical form called human was literally brought to this planet. So, you know, in, in, in Hopi legend, we, we were all created from, uh, Kukyang So'o, the spider grandmother, and she made us and she made the first people. And there's a whole 
each indigenous culture has that uh, story of evolution. But when I went back in time, I saw the human form being brought to earth as a new form that needed to be evolved. And this is the course of 20 million years, different phases of humanity happening so that the species of human could be evolved. We're very young. We're only like four years old in terms of big history. And, and aliens have been alive much, much longer than we have, which is why you hear stories of people being abducted. I talked to lots of people who've had very upfront and close experience with aliens. I myself have had that experience. And I know that there is a disconnect from the emotional body. That's the gift that humans have is that we have this incredible emotional system that we can feel. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, that feels so bad. You know, we have this, this amazing experience, which is totally tied to our karma. Our karma is unresolved emotional wounds from past lives. So as we go around trying to clear our karma, you know, aliens have already been through that. They, they're past it. They've moved on. They're in a much more neutral kind of unfeeling state. And we look at that with all of our feelings and go, oh, that's just so awful. They were so cold and uncaring. I agree. I don't really like that. I don't really like aliens. I think any aliens on this planet are here because they have an agenda just like humans. Mm. They want water. They want resources. They want our tissue samples. They want to recreate a whole, you know, uh, populace of of hybrids. I mean, this is th this whole glorification of aliens concerns me because I feel I've only met one group of aliens that I thought were okay. <laughs> they were like okay. Mm. And they and they came here to impart some wisdom on a scientist and then and then they left. Yeah. And the last person that they came and imparted wisdom to was Sir Isaac Newton. Yes. And they took you, well, those beings that you're talking about, they took you on the other side of the moon. They did. And they showed me that there is a space station on the other side of the moon. I mean, I was, I was blown away. What's, I, what's going I, on I, there? Well, I think there's a whole subculture of beings that are living on the other side of the moon. And you know, and I know, Greys have influenced and been a big part of human history for centuries. Mm. Reptilians, they've been here since probably around the beginning of what we know as Earth. And, you know, there's other new species of aliens that have come in. But I don't, you know, this whole kumbaya, let's meditate and get in touch with with aliens is a little risky. I, I've I've had too many encounters, and I'll give you a really good example. I had a client in Ohio. This guy was 250 pounds. He he worked in concrete and cement. He was very sturdy, and he had an implant and an implant in his arm. I was in Portland, Oregon. He was in Ohio. I took that implant out of his arm because I can do that. I can show up in front of somebody, do the work. And then, you know, there you have it. So I took that implant out. Mm. This guy was audibly screaming on the phone. And I'm like, wow. I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt you. And he said, oh, my God, it's so painful. And I got it out. And that night I, I had gone to the store. It was dark. I pulled into the driveway, opened up the back of the car to get the groceries out. And I could hear them. Mm. And oh, I turned the aliens and I turned around and I saw this ship up in the sky and this searchlight moving around really erratic. And they said, you, you have no right to take that from him. And I said, I have every right to take that from him. You don't have any right to put that in him. Mm, put him in and their I place. Said, oh, I did. <laughs> and I, I told them to, you know, off, you know, the first word. And um, and I basically said, you know, you have you have no right to interfere at all. And all of a sudden the ship, I could see the ship. It just went straight up. 
And, and I knew it was like, oh my God, these guys, they're, they're, it's like they're bullies, you know, their intention is to scare us and, you know, create paralysis and all this stuff so that we won't interfere. But in fact, we all have the gift of free will mm. and free will is really connected to knowing your boundaries, knowing that you are a divine child of God, an infinite soul inhabiting a human form and nothing, entities, aliens, nothing has a right to be in your field, your auric field or your body. You live by that code, you'll keep that riff raft out. Yeah. <laughs> it's super interesting that you're saying that perspective on aliens because right now there is not only in the spiritual community, but even in the mainstream now, it's becoming everything about UFOs, disclosure, you know, when are when are they gonna come down? When are we gonna meet them? What's gonna happen? And there's so much speculation on on everything. And I love that you're sh also sharing we need to be cautious. This is also dangerous territory. Um, but instead of putting people sort of in a vibration of of getting getting scared about what's going to happen, um, right. how do you empower them to know like we are part of this cosmic um, interrelationship with other beings, but we're also here to to do our own mission. We're also here um, for a different purpose in that. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. We've got a whole society that is addicted to coffee, sugar, alcohol, drugs, gaming, texting, uh, porn. I mean, you name it, clothes, shopping, we're addicted and we're operating as an addictive society. So in that addiction, you put spiritualism in the pot and now people are addicted to you know, crystals and ayahuasca ceremonies and, you know, uh, running to the shaman to get some, whatever. There's, there's another form of addiction. And my feeling about people getting ready, people being aware, which I just made a documentary short about aliens. So I can't wait when that comes out for you to see it. Mm. But I feel like there is a, a responsibility that we need to take. Our species has lived between two modalities, the victim and the perpetrator. And when the aliens come, oh, we're the victim, you know? But when somebody comes along and says something that we don't like, we become the bully. Oh, I don't like that, you know? So we have to learn our own psychology. We have to learn our own inner you know, healing and work on ourselves so that we are no longer the victim or the perpetrator, but we're really in a neutral place. We're in our peace so that when the aliens do come, good, bad, or otherwise, we're ready. We're in a, we're not freaked out. We're just in a place of, of recognizing this is a part of the human experience. They've always been here. They've always influenced us. But do we approach it from a place of fear? Do we approach it from a place of, yeah, I have really clear boundaries. And I told them, no, you're not allowed to come into my space. We can do that. Mm. Certainly you would do that if someone were uh, trying to break into your house and take what you have. You'd say, no, you're not allowed in my space. It's no different. We just, you know, we, we get... We're like little kids, you know, we get really worked up like, ooh, this happened or that happened. And and we stay in that four-year-old mindset instead of being the adults and saying, okay, what is my vibration? What am I doing inside of myself that can keep me in a state of peace? And that peace is expanding all day long so that I'm able to observe and experience everybody for who they are and what they have to say. And I'm not going back into that victim perpetrator mode. Mm. And you've also taught a <laughs> process of protection that involves the colors blue, silver, and gold. If you wanna mm -hmm. get a little bit into that so people know sure. that they can also protect sure. I, themselves energetically. 
Absolutely. I always tell my clients who've had alien stuff in their field or I've removed, you know, implants from their body, that if you ask creator, God, whatever you're praying and doing in your meditation for the blue light of protection and then the silver light to go around that and the gold light to go around that and that you're just in a bubble of blue, silver and gold, that it's really good protection to keep sort of that kind of energy out. But more important is, you know, again, I I mean, I I do what's called the Meditation Peace Project every month. It's an online Zoom meditation. And and I work with people on getting to that peace and expanding their peace. Mm. That's like my thing. Um, Because there's so much work to be done on that emotional level, karmic level. Let's at least be practicing our meditation and expanding the peace. Yes. And now that we touched on aliens, a lot of people are going, what do you mean, Sonia? Like the the Pleiadians are beautiful beings. They're here. They've always helped me. (laughs) Let me answer that. Pleiadians are not aliens. Ah, They're demigods. They are Mm -hmm. benevolent beings, just like the Norse gods, Odin, Thor, Freya. You've got the Hopi gods, you have the Mayan gods, you've got the Greek gods, the Egyptian gods. They are benevolent beings. They're right up there with the angels. Those guys have come through and helped shape different cultures throughout time. Mm. And and the, the, the aliens, no, they're not benevolent beings, but Pleiadians are not aliens. In fact, the Pleiadians have had such an influence on each culture and I write about that in my book, Spirit Traveler. They've had such an influence, but they didn't want anyone to know. It's like they had this huge influence on Salisbury Plain and where Stonehenge was built and the whole thing that happened at Stonehenge. But the Norse gods came in. Hey, we're here. We're cool. And and they got all the credit. Mm. They got all the credit. Yeah. So, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's a whole community of these demigods that, um, I feel is, is important. It's important as to who we are and why we are the way we are today. And Sonia, when you've time traveled to these moments of history, you've seen humanity actually living amongst these demigods. And actually mm-hmm. interrelating, procreating with the human race at the time to create a new species, a new upgraded DNA. Um, can you t- walk us through that that time when these beings were living amongst humanity and and how they helped de- develop our civilization to where it is today? Yeah, when when I've gone back to different sites in Norway and I've seen the Norse gods coming out of the stone circle and talking to me, I'm shown back in time. Of course, I've time traveled back to that time where they have taken human form and they've literally walked among the people in the villages. There are shows on TV that depict that. I mean, this is not unknown in history that the gods have done this. Um, Marvel in and Thor. Yeah, sure, sure. In Egypt, the Egyptian gods would take physical form and be present in front of the people. You know, there's lots of, of there's even things out at Hopi that happen that you know that the deity, the god is there because there's sounds and, and all kinds of things happening on the land. It, it, it happens all over the planet in every culture. We have become numb to recognizing these signs. We've become numb. We're, we're not, we're not in that place that the people were in at 10,000 BC when this phase of humanity began. And everybody was sort of like, okay, it's, it's new and we're going to rebuild. We're not mm. there anymore. We're, we're quite anesthetized and, and happy and fat. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you've been told by these, by these beings, these demigods, they've said we're coming back. What does that mean? Well, they'll come back 
at the next phase of humanity that I described our children, grandchildren heralding that new phase. So mm -hmm. they will come back. And does the end of this phase mean some catastrophic event like we experience in Atlantis and Lemuria? Yeah, you know, that only feeds fear if I go into that angle of it. I think if we can all embrace, number one, we will all die at some point. Number two, the earth is powerful. She is the reason we're here. Our karma is more dialed into her than it is with all these soulmates and twin flames and all this stuff that we want to focus on. It's about her. And when she is done with the earth, when she has cycled and finished her phase of that body and that body ceases to exist, the soul of the earth will go and inhabit a new body. And guess what? We're all going to go there next. That's mm. our connection is the earth. So when people say to me, oh, I can't wait to get off this planet. I'm just so done. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you're missing the point because her soul, the being that inhabits this planet, that's what we're all connected to. I mean, when we say the earth is our mother, I mean, that is an understatement. Mm. <laughs> that's like, no kidding. And the souls that are on earth, on Gaia, it was there sort some sort of karmic tie that we've had with this conscious being that is our planet? Um, why yes. did our souls choose to come to this planet in, in instead of all the plethora of millions of other planets that there are in the galaxy? It's because of her. It's because of her. It, it just blows my mind. It is so freaking simple. And you know, the people of ancient times knew that. That's why the high priestesses of, of Stonehenge and Avery Circle and all these different sacred places around the planet, they knew that. That's why they worked with the earth. Avery Circle was a hospital. That's where people went to get healing. There's a part of the circle that's called the cove. And people would stand in the cove and get assessed, almost like when I do a, a, a medical you know, survey of someone's body and what's going on, they would get that um, scan. And then there were three healing pits in Avery Circle. Mm. They would get put in one of those pits, depending on what the problem was, and they'd get doctored and healed. In one of those pits, if it was serious enough, they were literally taken off planet to be healed and brought back. Hello, Pleiadians, right? So, so th there's a magic that this planet has that they knew in ancient times. They got it, they worked with it, and they really revered the earth. That's why there's so much about ancient societies working, praying for fertility and rain and all the things that the earth has to give. Even in my Hopi culture, it's the same. The ceremonies are about fertility and rain and the planet. Mm. I'd love to help people differentiate between, you've mentioned the realm of consciousness versus dimensions. And you've said that the earth is in the second or third realm of consciousness, but we're going into a fifth dimension. What are the two differences there? That What's going on there? Okay. If you think of energy, we go back to quantum physics, you think of energy and you think of dimensions being the vibe that you're in, there's also realms which are sort of these, it's kind of like an elevator that moves through that dimension, right? So right now <clears throat> you're sitting in the fifth dimension, right? Hmm. You feel that? Maybe six. No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, feel feel the vibe around you right now, okay? I'm going to move you into the seventh dimension right now. So just feel the energy. Okay, are you feeling anything? I feel a bit lighter. Yep, I feel it in my head, mm. the back of my head. Yeah. My, my body got warmer. Uh-huh. Okay. That's a dimensional shift. A realm shift 
-hmm. The earth is naturally in the second realm. Think about the realms almost like the chakras, the second chakra, fertility, you know, sexuality. I mean, my God, the earth creates more things in one day than we we can in lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. So the earth is in the second realm. Humans are mostly in the third realm. That's back up to the third chakra and, and power struggles and community and people and, you know, defining who we are. Okay. Fourth realm. If we move into the fourth realm, that's more of that spiritual place that we want to be in. Yeah. And, you know, shifting dimensions is something that I know how to do, I don't teach it, but I know how to move through dimensions and I know how to move through realms. But if you think of it like dimensions, you know, and realms, it's mm. it's sort of this cosmic energy shift that goes on. It's like a grid. It's like a grid. If I drew a picture of a grid right now, you know, I would point that we're here in this vibration and the Dalai Lama is here in this vibration. Do you see what I mean? It's like a grid. Mm. Yeah. And that's that that's why there are certain opportunities that we draw into our life, certain people that have, can only come through when we're resonating at a similar vibration or dimension as them, right? Correct. Correct. Mm. And that's why, ooh, more quantum physics. That's why people tend to project or transfer their emotional content onto another person and not even get what is happening in the present moment. Mm. Okay. So for example, when somebody calls me and says, Oh, you know, <laughs> I want to talk about my family and my situation. And I went to a tarot card reader and I had a reading and this is what she said. That's their only experience. So nine out of 10, they're going to project the tarot card reader kind of vibe onto me rather than being clear and present to experience what you just experienced. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. And, and, and people can't even get past the visual part. That's why I don't, I don't do camera when I talk to, I only talk on the phone with people because I don't want any interference of visual stuff mm. because these changes can only happen in the emotional body is that why the visual can't get in the way when you're doing these these types of readings no because people tend to okay we have four major learning modalities that develop when we're ba when we're little mm. and as we develop some kids are visual, their primary is visual, their secondary, let's say it's kinesthetic, they feel everything. So that child grows up really good in school, but very confused and maybe not supported in all that they feel. Some kids are tonal and their secondary learning modality is mental. They have to think about it. So they've got to hear it and they have to think about it. So as adults, we take those learning modalities. Sure, all of them are happening, tonal, mm -hmm. visual, mental, and kinesthetic, but we have a primary and a secondary. So we're filtering our world through those modalities. And then on top of it, we're projecting our emotional content. Oh, you're angry. I'm angry. Oh, you hate that person. Oh, I hate that person. It's like we polarize with each other energetically with emotion mm. and we've got these learning modalities that are sort of directing you know like you, let's take a couple the husband's visual and tonal and the wife is kinesthetic and mental yeah yep boy those two just missed every conversation and they argue a lot huh. let's say the wife is kinesthetic and tonal and the husband is visual and tonal they talk because they know that they need to hear each other. The other two parts don't match up so well. So, so there's a lot at play when we're trying to communicate what we're communicating. And we're so involved in this barrage of fifth dimensional, wah, this is going on. 
that it becomes even harder for people to be present. Hmm. Words Meditate. are, yes, meditation. You're saying? Yeah, it's, it's the key, meditation. Mm. Yeah. And I've learned also that words are so limiting. And, mm -hmm. and even, even when it comes to communication, I was just, I was just looking into a episode on ancient civilizations that you were featured in, where they talked about the different types of symbolism that are sort of ingrained in human consciousness, things like the ankh, the cross, the spiral. And I'd love to know how the beings that you've communicated with is this sort of a telepathic communication? Are you communicating through symbols, through English? How does this communication work? And how can we make it flow more easily and apply that to our interhuman relationships as well? Right. I think in the fifth dimension, we're really developing more and more our telepathic abilities. People are experiencing that daily. You know, they think about their mother and she calls. They think about their friend Susie and she calls. They, you know, there's all these synchronicities. Oh, I'm seeing 111 on the clock every day. I'm seeing, you know, 444 every day. You know, all of these energetic vibes mm. are impacting us in our world. Unfortunately, our world has also put 5G up and sprayed us with chemtrails and given us shots of biological weapons, and all of it is not compatible energetically with what we're meant to experience in this higher frequency. Huh. Ah, as if we don't have enough to deal with. So now we have to really shield ourselves and sort of be in that state of peace, like I talked about. Mm -hmm. So we're not engaged, we're not getting worked up, we're not you know, getting all drama out. But in fact, we're operating from a really clear place of being able to hold the peace. Because the more we hold peace in ourselves, the more we create peace in the world. Mm. And it's so easy for us to sort of get, you know, out there and get tangled up in something, you know, stand on the hill. I mean, there's a lot of hills we're standing on and dying for. <laughs> but, yeah. but, Going to the hill with some peace is important. Yeah. And and mentioning... Oh, talking, talking to the beans. I'm sorry. When I talk to them, I see their mouths move. And they do talk English to me. Oh, really? Um, sometimes it's telepathic. A lot of times with the Norse gods, it's been very telepathic. The Egyptian gods t totally like talking. Um, it, it depends on where I am and what time period I'm in. I've actually had to ask them to speak in English because they start talking to me in their language. Huh. And you have no idea what they're saying when they talk in their... No, I'm like, their... hello, English. <laughs> I need English. <laughs> I and, don't know the ancient tongue. Huh. And these are the gods, the demigods that we're talking about. Correct. Correct. What, what defines a being as a demigod? What sort of qualities do they have for us to be able to to label them as, as, as a demigod? Are they equipped They're with huge. some sort of special yeah. powers? Hmm. They're huge. They're 12, 13, 14 feet tall. They're big. And they are, they're benevolent in that if you have the ability to visually see them, there's kind of a same energy glow vibration that angels have. So when I see angels, it, there is a similar quality. It's different, but a similar quality to the demigods. Hmm. And angels, do they have the capacity to come into form or are they more in, in the spirit realm? Do they stay in the spirit form? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of feel like the Catholic church took a real you know, left hand turn on the whole fallen <laughs> angel, you know, all this just whole, on that. <laughs> yeah, I just can't go there. I mean, I, I get it, but it's not what I experience. Mm. A angels are benevolent beings. I never have known or seen them to take physical form. And, um, and, and they're here to help us. They're the best help we could ever call on. And all of this hoopla about who are my guides? I mean, my God, we've got an entire angelic 
race of beings that are there to help, yeah. you know, to feel special that somehow we have guides is, is it, it, I think we're missing the point. The angels have always been there to help us and they're the best help because they are benevolent. They've never incarnated in physical form, so they don't have karma. Mm. And yeah. to call them forth, does it just require an intention, a ritual, a prayer? How can we call these beings when we oh need them in God. our assistance? There's a special phone number. No. <laughs> <laughs> 911 right now. <laughs> no. No, it's your it's your intention. It's you know, it's going into meditation or prayer and asking for Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Uriel to come and help you. Huh. Asking the archangels to be there, asking the highest angels of healing to help you. They're there to help us. And and your your intention is <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> your intention is everything. Everything. Mm. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was traveling to Venezuela and it was my first time there. I was I was visiting my girlfriend and I got really sick. This virus came down on me and I was, you know, in bed, you know, for four or five days. And oh, no. it almost dawned on me like I have all this knowledge, information about about healing, about angels. Why am I not utilizing them? And I sat one night, I was in a meditation and actually I did one that was guided. I have to give him a shout out, Steve Noble on YouTube. He has sort of meditations to help clear and call forth um, these high angelic beings, Michael, mm -hmm. Uriel, Gabriel, and sort of using their, their, their special powers of healing. The next mm -hmm. morning, I was completely new. I was like, I woke up, I'm like, my head doesn't hurt anymore. I feel mm -hmm. much better. And I think it was a, a vibrational shift and, and asking for that assistance for healing um, mm -hmm. and making the intention to do that and knowing that I had the capability, the power to invoke that energy. Um, and, and, it, and it shifted very quickly. It was amazing. Yeah, I, it's, it is. They're incredible. I, I had a friend whose liver was completely going out just really bad. She had like maybe one or two percent of her liver operating mm. and i held a meditation um I, I was there with her she was in the meditation and i asked the angels if they would give her a new liver and they did they showed up they took out the old one they put the new one in wow. and doctors were telling her at that time that she wouldn't live for probably maybe three months best and that was a good 12 years ago and she's still here <laughs> yeah i've heard so, very similar stories um yeah the uh, angels man they're very powerful yeah, yeah yeah let's talk about an upcoming spirit traveling book that you have coming out that you told me and the last one you went to i think it was around seven or eight different sites you traveled mm -hmm. from the pyramids to stonehenge um Hagar Quim, I, I, I'm, I'm mixing up the names right now, but I'd love to know in these next phase of a Spirit Travels, where were you taken? Where did you go? Well, I went to some really interesting sites. Um, I did go back to the Great Pyramid. There were things that needed to be covered uh, that I wasn't able to cover in the first book, I went to the Caffrey Pyramid in the first book. This one is actually at the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. But the most exciting chapter of all is I went back to Atlantis. Ooh. And yeah, Ooh. and it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. The heart, the, the connection that the people had and the alien influence of that time was fascinating. And I'm just giving you a little tidbit. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm super excited and I hope you know, you'll have me back so we can really talk about the book in depth when it comes out. But yeah, there's, there's some places that uh, I think 
you know, we have certain ideas because we're constantly bombarded with, you know, watching shows and reading people's books and all these things. And I try to stay away from all of that because I want my information to be very authentic and very like precise to what I experienced. Yeah. And that's why I'm excited about this book is because, you know, no influence. I went to Easter Island in one of the chapters and they showed me who made the big statues. Um, several times throughout the book, I went off planet to get the real answer of what happened. So I think people are going to be very excited. Yeah. <laughs> Sonia, you just sparked like at least a million questions firing right now in my brain. <laughs> but I, I feel like right now a lot of people are connecting to that ancient civilization of Atlantis. And, and a lot of people maybe are remembering lifetimes there. And, you know, you've even said when those portals opened up in, in the, the world that came before this one, that's when the star beings came and, and sort of constructed these civilizations of Atlantis, Lemuria, um, what can we learn about these civilizations? What sort of things? Because I know I want people to, to, when that book comes out, to read that chapter and read everything. But what can you sort of tell us um, as an intro to, to that civilization? To Atlantis? Yes. Um, that the people lived very close to the earth. That they chose the connectivity of the earth over technology. They had technology. They actually had ships. They could fly. But their connection to the earth and the the, the ceremonies and the, the reverence for the planet was always number one. And, and the influence, the alien influence, just like we experience today, my God, it's constant, mm. um, is, is truly something that um, brought about change in Atlantis. And I think that people remembering it's because we're in this final phase of this, of this hum human experience that people are remembering Atlantis. They're remembering the fall of Atlantis. Um, you know, a lot of people carry that um, <clears throat> migratory feeling in their soul body. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it Bef before COVID, People were migrating like crazy, living in California, moving to the East Coast, living on the East Coast, moving to Nevada, moving to Montana, moving to Arizona. People were migrating like crazy. The only thing that really stopped it was, you know, everybody had to shut down because of a biological weapon. And, and beyond that, mm. the migration still going on. People are still calling me saying, I think I need to move to Florida, you know, and they're, and they're, they're still feeling that inner call that we all have and we all carry since the beginning of this phase of humanity. Huh. So uh, I'm, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's all good. And I think people need to find where is that place I need to be in to finish out this phase of humanity. Where do you want to be? I want to be at the beach. <laughs> I'm uh, kidding. Me too. I need to be. I need to be close to a mass of water because I'm a yeah. I'm a cancer sign. I I I get recharged um, by by water and sunlight. And you did you see a lot of pyramids um, in ancient Atlantis? I did. I what, did. What and was I, their purpose? Well, first of all, it's it's a race of giants called Mu who built the pyramids. They're the ones that showed up with the blueprints for pyramids. And if you notice, all the pyramids are built on the Tropic of Cancer. They're all on that line of the earth. China, Egypt, South America. Oh, yeah, they're all there. Hmm. And, and they were built as transport systems. Um, when I went to Mexico, my husband and I, we went to Chichen Itza yeah. and the Temple of Kukulakan. Mm -hmm. And we had this guy who drove us. He was kind of like a guide, but, you know, he had no idea who I was until I handed him my book. <laughs> Here, you need to read this. And and um, I said to him, we were standing outside the Temple of Kukulakan, and I said, have you seen the pyramid inside the pyramid? And further, have you seen the cenote, 
that's at the at the very base. Mm. And he went, oh, how do you know that? I said, you really want to go there? Okay. <laughs> you want to know who I am? <laughs> you want to know really how I saw that? Anyways, he said, hardly nobody knows that. He couldn't believe that I knew that. And yes, he had been inside the pyramid and seen the smaller pyramid that was inside it. And he knew about the cenote underground. Mm. And I get these confirmations all the time about what I have reported back in time and what actually has been discovered now. Yeah. And the Great Pyramid... Because th that's that's one that fascinates a lot of people, and I'll actually be traveling there in just a couple months. Um, what was this? Was this pyramid or the, this this scheme of pyramids? Was it built also from the demigods? What, did we receive help? How were they? How were they essentially um, created? So the, the giants worked with them. Okay, the giants, the the first beings that were here were the ant people the Savrock and the Savrock are giant ants, but they walk upright and they're very, uh, they're very responsible for all the underground tunneling systems that have saved humanity over and over. They're really, really good beings. And one of those pyramids goes directly to their home planet. That was their portal of getting to and from earth. The same with the Egyptian gods, a portal to where they come from is a part of that great pyramid system. Mm -hmm. It's a transport system. I transported through there back in time and went to three different places. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that we think in our evolved quantum physics understanding that we have to get in a ship and go through space. And yet there are all of these portal systems or wormholes that you can travel through that really do exist. Mm. And I tell you, the person who impacted me the most is what William Shatner said when he came back from a, a Bezos, uh, you know, space flight. I mean, his it, it. I cried when I read what he said. He said, I, I was so excited and everything that I experienced, everything that I went through was nothing of what I thought it would be. Space is cold. It's very empty. And it was such a devastating experience. And looking back at Earth, that's where it's all happening. That's where the energy is. That's where we need to be focused. And I went, oh, God, Captain Kirk, of all things for you to say, now at 90 years old that was brilliant because mm. it's true and we and we do get that there's other life in the galaxy and beyond but those guys already know how to travel they're not traveling through space as we know it huh. they're entering the portals and how do you recognize a portal where it is do you is it a certain type of energy that you feel when you're approaching a portal when you're inside one i, I literally see it i see, see it, it. it's a, it, you know how we shifted the vibration i see the portal it's a whole different vibration it looks like a portal <laughs> it smells like a portal no <laughs> <laughs> a little rosemary a little mint <laughs> <laughs> and i step into it if i if i am needing to do something within that portal many times like if someone calls me in a session and they've got all kinds of alien activity going on that's not helpful for their family i have the ability to close the portal and i mm. do i close it mm. how many portals yeah. have you come across in in this lifetime oh i can't i i can't even count hmm. yeah hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah yeah yeah, because in the last yeah. phase of humanity, you said that four big portals opened up, some in yeah. China, Egypt, um, yes. in South America. So these are huge portals that, that carry a lot of energy, and then there's smaller portals. Correct. Like, how does that look like? Correct. Well, let, let's take stone circles. There are portals like Stonehenge, where energy comes into the earth and energy goes out from the earth. There's, there's swing side stone circle. That energy is simply cosmic energy coming in. There's different, there's different purposes 
for the earth. Mm. All of those portals are for the earth. She needs that cosmic energy. She needs to release energy. She needs the crystals in the soil so that she can recharge herself. She needs the oil in the ground. That's her blood. She needs things to be in place. And we're robbing her of all of that energy. It's sort of like our own... I mean, taking from hermetic philosophy, as above, so below, it's it's sort of like our own chakra system. Would you say a chakra acts sort of like a portal as well? Sure, sure. But the chakras connect and all hook into that main central line, the vertical power current. So like tubular flowers, they insert into the main power cord and they open out and they spin clockwise really fast. And they've got screens that protect them all through your auric field. It's a very complex system. When I work with people who are dying, I literally watch the chakras disconnect from the power current. And guess what? As that person is dying, the vertical power current gets huge. And that is the tunnel of light that they travel back up to source to. Wow. Yeah, wow. mind blowing. I, I've seen it so many times and it's like, wow, this is cool. <laughs> huh. And humans, do we also have the power to open up portals um, where there once wasn't before? No, we don't. Mm. I don't I don't feel that we do. I think that that is um, maybe a part of some you know, I want to have superpowers and be a superhero, uh, you know, kind of mindset that the spiritual community can be known for. Yeah. Um, I think opening up a portal, well, first of all, why would you do that? And second of all, why would you be so disrespectful to the earth, your mother, to mm. create something that maybe she doesn't need at that time? Because everything that we do affects her. Huh. Everything we do, your thoughts, your actions, everything we do. I get up every day and the first thing I do is I say, thank you. Thank you for my life. Mm. You know, yeah. it's so important that we get back to the planet. And I don't mean, you know, go crazy and, and not drive cars and all the crap that, you know, it's going on with smart cities and all that. I mean, that's just more manipulation and whatever. I'm talking about just the natural reverence and respect for the for the planet, yeah. you know, talking to the trees, talking to the plants. I, I've said this in so many interviews a long time ago, the goddess, the earth spirit came right up in front of me. I was out in the garden and she, she said, you know, in, in the old days, people would tell me their stories. They would tell me what was wrong. And she said, they don't do that anymore. And she mm. wasn't blaming. She wasn't shaming. She wasn't criticizing. She was just reporting. They don't do that anymore. And I encourage people, go outside. You know, don't turn on the TV or, you know, call someone that you know. Go outside and tell your story to her. She wants to hear it, you know? Wow, Sonia, we need to have you back on. <laughs> I'm saying that right now, and I've loved every single minute of this conversation. Um, we end every single podcast with a segment called The Final Trio. So they're just rapid-fire questions, fun questions. The first two are personalized to the guest, and the last one we ask at the end of every single interview. Um, but before that, Everyone right now is going to want to connect with you, learn more about your books, your teaching methods, everything. So where would you send people to connect with you further? Um, my website is Sonia, S-O-N-J-A, Grace, G-R-A-C-E dot com. Hmm. And I have six books out. I've got three that are getting ready to go to the publisher. So lots of material. I'm all over Gaia TV, lots of shows. Um, I'm on UFO Witness on uh, television. I, I'm on a lot of different things, so you can find me. Yeah. Awesome. 
So now for the final trio. Um, this is my one of my favorite parts because I, we get to you know make these questions fun. Um, the first one that I had for you is, what does the spiral mean to you? The spiral means that in the old times when people carve those into the rocks, they were connected to a much bigger picture of where we came from and where we were going. And it represents to me and all the time traveling I've done and seen these spirals that there is an awareness of time and space and how we are moving through it. Could you say that we could essentially use that symbol of the spiral to defy time and space? I think that we could use that symbol of the spiral to learn a great deal about the universe and beyond if mm -hmm. we allow ourselves to get out of our own way. I love that. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, I know that when you spirit travel, your guides are the ones that take you. Um, you don't necessarily decide where they're going to take you or where you want to go. But if you had the opportunity to let your, your guides know, I want to travel here. I want to go there yeah. at this point in history. Where would you go right now? Um, I would want to go to, um, I, I've, I, I wrote a chapter about Gobekli Tepe uh, in my new Spirit Traveler book. Mm -hmm. And I would love to go back further at that area of Turkey and um, really back during Atlantis, um, Egypt and all of Northern Africa was connected with a, a landmass between Europe and the Middle East and Africa. It was all one landmass. So when the comets hit, you know, the, the, the landmass in between Europe and Northern Africa broke off and moved with the ocean currents to what is now uh, Antarctica. And <clears throat> I feel that, you know, being able to spirit travel, if I was to dial up, hey, this is where I want to go. Um, I, I'm fascinated with that area during Atlantean times. Huh. Um, yeah. Further beyond that, I, I'm really into space travel right now. So, yeah, mm. I'm, I'm down with going out there. Where, where in space have you gone? Um, I've spent a lot of time in the Orion constellation. I've gone to Pleiades. Um, I've, I've been taken to some planets. I don't even know what they're called, but I know that, um, there's some pretty remarkable beings huh. in, in our galaxy. Remarkable. Uh, yeah. Do they all hold a similar structure, shape, body system, yes. like humanoids? Yes. Yes. Huh. Yes. I mean, even though the grays or the, the small whites or the tall grays, I mean, everybody has sort of this shape except for the the mantis beings they're much more like a mantis they're creepy um mm. but i find that most alien species uh everybody's got sort of a similar type form big mm. longer taller huh. yeah awesome um for the final question um <laughs> sonia this is a question that actually influences us to travel a little bit out into the future Mm -hmm. I know you're used to I know you're used to going into the past, but this question in particular, it forces us to travel into the future around 15, 20 years. And hypothetically, let's say you were given the chance to have a time capsule and leave behind a time capsule. And this time capsule, its intention would be toward the next generation of leaders, the new star seeds, the people that are going to carry into the new earth, um, sort of pioneer that world. And you could leave behind a time capsule with anything that you would want in it for these mm -hmm. leaders to open and sort of gather all the tools, the knowledge, the wisdom that they would need then to go forward into the new epoch of humanity. What would you put in the time capsule? Okay, so the street version of that is if you treat your mom shitty, it's going to be bad karma for you. <laughs> That's the street mm. version. The scientific <laughs> version is 
be mindful because the reason you're here is this planet. And if you take care of her, she will take care of you. If a dog has a case of fleas and the dog can't manage it, the dog will shake hard to get rid of the fleas. That is the same principle as the earth. If we don't start treating her with respect, kindness, love, and care for the being that she is, she will get infested enough, annoyed enough, you know, frustrated enough that she will shake hard so that she can relieve herself of such a vibration, that disrespect, that that unacknowledgement that people have adapted for not caring about the planet, and I mean on a spiritual level, is what causes the earth not to punish us or be disregarding of us, but to really realize that maybe it's time to clean house. It's time to clean this up so that I'm not feeling that vibe of hate and anger and resentment and jealousy. We got we to really get over this stuff and get back to her quickly because we really are coming up to a time where historically the earth has cleaned house. Historically, the earth has uh, shifted and changed so that she can uh, adjust her body and breathe better. Mm -hmm. And if we're, if we're aligned with her, maybe we will survive it. So yes. the time capsule is really um, be mindful of this great, being whose back you are living upon and mm -hmm. take care of her. Mm -hmm. And being inspired by a good friend of mine, Richard Rudd, he talks about the art of contemplation. If you were to leave a contemplative question on the top of this time capsule for these leaders, before they open it, they read your question. What, what, what would you ask them? What contemplative what question peace? would you? What is what? peace? Mm -hmm. What is peace? Is peace something outside of ourselves that John Lennon sang about in the 70s? Or is peace something that we really can obtain and that we have innately in our soul body? Our soul body is made up of the peace. The connective tissue is hope and the cells is divine love. That dials us into God 24 seven. If we just take the time to go inward, so that would be the preface I put on the <laughs> the time capsule. Sonia, thank you so much for sharing your medicine, your wisdom, your love, your heart. Um, I genuinely love this conversation, every single second of it. And I would love to continue our conversations down the line and explore the mysteries of humanity together. Thank you so Me much. Too. Me too, you. I, I just, I have to really say your ability to interview was spectacular and i so i so appreciate that there the, your openness and your willingness to listen and you know just experience what i had to say is just lovely thank you so much of course you yeah. make it easy thank you yeah. thank you much love